Hello friends, welcome back to my channel. Welcome back to another Recent Reads video. This is gonna feature every book that I've read this year so far. I don't actually know if there were any outstanding books from last year, but at this point, I've already got too many books to cover. Um, so without further ado, let's jump right into it. We're gonna start off with the Rapid Fires. These are books that I don't really remember much of, or I just like don't have much to say about them. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly give you like a one sentence synopsis and my rating and like quick thoughts. And if you wanna know anything more about any of these books, feel free to leave me a comment and I can expand in there. The first book is Death by Bubble Tea, which is a cozy mystery following our main character, who um, helps her dad like run his family business, which is a restaurant. Um, but basically they set up a stand at this night market that serves bubble tea. And then someone is found dead that night um, after having frequented their little like bubbles tea stand. Um, so she gets caught up in this like, little cozy mystery. She needs to solve it. I gave this one two stars. I did not really enjoy this one that much. I did read it. I thought it was an easy read. It was fine, whatever. I'm just not fully convinced that cozy mysteries perhaps are for me. I don't know. I remember distinctly really loving cozy mysteries when I was like in high school. I don't know if I've talked about this before, but I used to volunteer um, at a library when I was in high school. Like it was where I did uh, a good chunk of my like high school volunteer hours. And so I read a lot of cozy mysteries and like Harlequin romances back in those days because those are just really easy books to like finish in a day. But anyway, the point is I think I've kind of grown out of cozy mysteries. I don't really think they're for me anymore. Or maybe this one was just like a bad one. I don't know. I just remember not being very like interested in the mystery aspect. I found the characters to be irritating, um, but I did finish it. So I gave it two stars. Um, the second book is The Lies We Tell by Katie Zhao. This is, I thought this was supposed to be a sequel to um, How We Fall Apart, but I don't know if it's actually a sequel uh, now that I've read it, but it is another kind of like dark academia type um, mystery thriller. I like this one better than the first one. I gave this one 3.5 stars. Um, I don't actually remember the plot of it that much to be quite honest with you, but I do remember distinctly feeling like it was a little bit more engaging than uh, how We Fall Apart, and I also think it was a little bit less derivative, because How We Fall Apart, if you've read it, is very, very much derivative of, like, Pretty Little Liars. Not necessarily in a bad way, but just, like, very much clearly inspired by that, versus this felt a little bit less specifically inspired by, like, one piece of media. The next book I read was Ghost Music. Um, I gave this one three stars. This is, like, a weird kind of, like, surrealist book with like some mushroom stuff about this woman who is in a relationship with this man who like is never really home and never really present and it's about like her loneliness. The thing I remember most about it is there's at the beginning of the book, um, for the first half at least, there's kind of like this plot line of like her trying to get along with her mother-in-law and I actually really enjoyed their relationship but then in the second half of the book that really dropped off and so like I also dropped off at that point. Next is After Parties. Um, I actually talked about this in I think my last vlog of last year. Um, I bought this around the holidays um, and I finished it earlier on in this year. This is a short story collection by a Cambodian American author who has unfortunately since publishing this book um, passed away. So this I believe might be one of his only published works unless there are other things that they've done in the past. Um, but this is a short story collection surrounding this Cambodian American um, community and the intergenerational trauma and the trauma that this community collectively faces given the history of Cambodia and the genocide that happened in Cambodia that led a lot of the members of this community or their parents to flee from Cambodia to America. I just really really enjoyed this. I think the writing is fantastic. I think that the explorations of the themes um, and the interconnectedness of the different stories really really made me feel a lot of different emotions as I was reading this. Like with any other short story collection, there's definitely standouts. There's certain stories I like more than the others. Um, but overall, I really highly recommend this collection if you enjoy uh, short stories, especially more kind of like slice of life stories that explore a community. 
Next on this list is Hang the Moon. Um, this is the second book in that, like, Alexandra Belfler trilogy, like the astrology trilogy. I don't, I don't know what it's called. But this is Brendan's book. Brendan is Darcy from book one's brother. He's also the business partner of the other main character from book one. I can't remember her name now. I really, really enjoyed this one a lot more than I thought I would. I think um, the main female character, I think her name is Annie. She is very relatable. She is a very, like, lonely adult, kind of is going through the motions and there's a lot about her that I can certainly like relate to a lot especially that feeling of like you not having a, a support system where you live and like how to cope with that and like where where is home really like that, those kind of explorations I really really liked her as a character um and I mean I liked Brendan in the other two books um but I feel like you got to really know him in this book and I really appreciated the book for that um the next two things I read were What the Dead Know and Undercover um by Nevo and Tamsin Weir these are two short stories from that Amazon horror collection I've forgotten what the collection is called now. The most famous one I think from that collection is the Alex E. Harrow one. Something something Six Deaths of a Saint or something like that. Um, that one went like a bit viral I feel. Um, and when I saw that I was not that interested because something about Alex E. Harrow I don't know, like, none of the premises that she writes, like, intrigue me in any way, shape, or form. And so, like, I wasn't that intrigued by it, but then I looked it up, and then I saw these two, and I was like, I must pick these up. Um, so I did pick these two up on audio. I really, really enjoyed them. What the Dead Know, um, has kind of more gothic vibes to it, um, and then Undercover is a bit longer of a short story. I think it's, like, double the length of the other one, um, but it is more, it feels very, like, noir-esque, but, like, it has that signature Tams and Weir uh, unhingedness that I really, really like. Um, and so I really, really enjoyed both of these. I gave them both 4.5 stars, um, and I'm definitely going to be rereading them um, since I now own the audiobooks. Um, the audiobooks are both really good as well. And then the next two things I want to quickly talk about are two manga that I read recently. Witch Hat Atelier Volume 1. Um, I read this because obviously this is like a very popular manga. The art style is nice. It's just not my preferred cup of tea. It definitely has a more western feel to it. I don't know how to explain it, but it definitely has like a slightly more western aesthetic to it. I can definitely see why so many people like it. It is not my new favorite thing. I definitely want to continue the story and see where it goes. Um, I don't know if like magical witchy girl manga is like my cup of tea anymore. I can definitely see myself loving this when I was in like high school. I would have absolutely loved this, um, but now as an adult I don't know if I love this. Um, I gave this one three stars. Um, and then the second thing I read was a side character's love story. I think there's 14 volumes out right now. I read all 14. This is kind of like a classic kind of romance manga, but instead of following kind of like the main character type of characters, you're following these two main characters who are a little bit more introverted, a little bit more like side character feels. Um, so it's like about their love story. I don't think it's like the most memorable manga and it's also like not the most exciting, like not, not a lot happens. And so um, if that's not your cup of tea, then you might not like this, but I enjoyed it. I had a good time. Um, and I gave this three stars. I definitely think it's a little dragged out. I'm not gonna lie. I need there to be like some sort of ending in sight for it because I don't know where it's going at this point. So that is the end of my rapid fire. I guess it wasn't that rapid, um, but we're gonna dive into now the books that I have a little bit more thoughts on, I guess. Um, but the first of these is The Children of Chaos by Trudy Skies. Uh, this is the second book in the Cruel God series. It's a sequel to The 13th Hour, which if you've watched my favorites of 2022 video, you will know that that was one of my favorite books of last year. I actually started this book as soon as I finished the first book last year, but I didn't finish it until January. Um, so I'm talking about it here. I gave it 4.5 stars in the end. I loved this. I loved it more than book one. I know I gave both books 4.5 stars, but like, I feel as though this was like a stronger 4.5, you know what I mean? It's still not quite five stars. Like I just feel like it's just missing that little something for it to be like a full, full, full five stars. But like I loved it. I thought it was so much fun. It's hard for me to explain the premise because it is a sequel, but basically the world we're in, we're in this like city mainly called Chime. Um, and Chime is the city that is basically... Um, a safe haven of sorts for all these people, all these creatures of this world, um, because this world is run by 12 gods, each who have their own domains and their own kind of like mortals. But in the middle of all these 12 domains, there's a place called Chime where um, 
all the mortals can ha basically have their own place to live that is separate and free from their gods. But as we learn very, very quickly on in book one, the gods have so much power over these like mortals so that even though they're in the city, they're not truly free. And also the city is not as idealistic as it paints itself to be. We're still following Kale and Quen mostly. We do actually have Jinx POVs as well, but we're mainly still following the two same main characters as they kind of have found themselves caught up in this kind of like conflict between the gods, so to speak. I'm trying to keep it vague because like everything is a spoiler for book one. So I'm like, I just don't want to reveal too much in case you haven't read book one. Um, but I really, really love this series. If you are into like gas lamp, steampunk fantasy, if you are into arcane, I must say it again. If you like arcane, you must read this series because it is so freaking good. Um, one thing I will say that I really loved about book two is that in book one, you know of all the different worlds, but you only really I think visit one domain um, in book one and most of the book takes place in Chime but in book two we actually get to venture out of Chime a little bit more and see more of the domains if not all of them. I'm trying to think if we actually went to all of them or maybe just most of them. I'm not sure but we definitely got to see a lot more of the world and what I love about this world is that every single domain is like a mini world in and of itself and it's just so cool. Part of the book feels very like video game vibes because of that because like each domain is a different ecosystem, a different world which I feel like is a very common feature in a lot of video games and so I don't know. I just really, really enjoyed it. I love the expansions and the, the building upon of the relationships in book two. I just had such a good time. This is one of those books that once I pick up, it's so hard for me to put down and it's so easy for me to just breeze through a hundred pages in like one sitting, um, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but for me is quite a lot these days because I just find physical reading to be quite difficult sometimes, you know? I really, really highly recommend the book. I really highly recommend the series. I cannot recommend it enough. I need more people to read this so that we can talk about it but like it is so freaking good. Anyway, moving on to the second book I want to talk about and that is The Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang. This is a romance. I feel like if you look up like Asian authored romances, this is probably the number one on that list. I ended up giving this three stars. I... Here's the thing. As I was reading it, I was having a great time. I was really enjoying this book. But then when I sat back to think about the book a little bit more, I was like, you know, there are some number of elements that are a little uncomfy. I'm not gonna lie. Let me backtrack. Let me give you a synopsis. In this book we are following our main character Stella. She has autism and has struggled a lot with dating. So she gets this idea in her head that she is going to hire an escort to help her practice, I guess. And so she hires Michael, I believe is his name. I could be wrong. And he agrees to this like practice setup and obviously they fall in love, whatever, whatever. Um, I thought it was a fun story to be quite honest with you. I do find the relationship dynamics now again now that I have spent more time away from it it is like the more I think about it the more uncomfortable it is. Michael is so unbelievably possessive like unbelievably so. There were moments throughout where like I understand the appeal of like jealousy or whatever in romance novels. There is definitely a point at which I thought this man needs to calm the fuck down. But one of the main issues I have with this book, the more I think about it, the more weird and problematic it is, is that Stella, the main character, despite what some of the different covers of this book want you to believe, Stella is a white woman. Okay. <laughs> Um, when I started reading this book, I honestly thought that she was supposed to be Asian. I really, really thought so. Be based on the cover, obviously the cover is like illustrated, it's a tiny picture, but like it, I thought she was Asian based on the cover and that's my bad. But also if you look at specifically the Illumicrate um, special edition cover, she really looks Asian in that cover. Um, she's not. She's a white woman. Um, the author has confirmed this. It's like someone asked it on Goodreads and the author replied being like, I envisioned her as Caucasian. Um, and so yeah, she's white. She's white. Um, that makes some of the things that happen in the book, some of the things that she says and does, and some of the reasonings behind why she chose to date Michael in the first place, a little weird to me. Like, it does give off Asian fetish vibes. It definitely gives off, um, I picked you because you kind of look like Daniel Henney and I have a thing for Asian men vibes. You know? Um, 
I don't know how I feel about that. Like, again, I really enjoyed this book in the moment as I was reading it. I had fun with it. But if I take a step back and think about this book, I think this book has so many problems. Um, and I can't in good conscience give it more than three stars, despite my pure enjoyment being probably closer to a four or 4.5 stars. Continuing on with the romances, I guess, though, um, recently, I renewed my Kindle Unlimited subscription. Um, and I binge read uh, Catherine Moon's Sweet Verse books, uh, specifically the first one, Baby and the Late Night Howlers, and then the two Lola and the Millionaires books, part one and part two. I think I read those three books in less than 48 hours, which is like uh, astounding, astounding. I love them, love them. I think I gave Baby 3.75 stars. Um, and then I gave Lola, the first Lola, four stars, and then the second one, three stars. I really, really enjoyed them. I thought they were a fun time. They're super sexy, super smutty. Um, if you don't know what they are, they are Omegaverse books. I'm not going to sit here and explain the Omegaverse to you. I feel like that's just not something I'm very comfortable doing. I also don't think I would do a good job of it. Um, there are many videos on the interwebs that can explain to you what the Omegaverse is. My first exposure to the Omegaverse was that, like, notorious lawsuit situation. If you are interested in, like, copyright law and, like, like you want to see where this like weird intersection of like copyright law and like fandom intersects, I actually really highly recommend looking into the Omegaverse uh, lawsuit because it's it's actually hilarious. Um, but anyway, so that's that was like my first like real exposure to like learning about what constitutes the Omegaverse. Um, and I've kind of been scared of it. I won't lie. Like, uh, if you are familiar at all with the Omegaverse, it's a little intimidating. I'm not gonna lie. Like, I just never thought it was gonna be my thing. But I feel like a lot of my friends in the bookish community really loves specifically Lola and the Millionaires. I feel like that book gets so much hype. Um, specifically, um, Mina from Mina Reads, I feel like she is really the one that like pushes these books and like has put it on my timeline the most. But basically, long story short, the Omegaverse, in order to explain this story, um, is this like alternate universe in which people have like s almost like secondary genders that like um, dictate their sexual needs? I guess? I don't know. I don't know how to explain this. Anyway, point is, in the first book, Baby and the Late, Late Night Howlers, Baby discovers at the age of like 26, which is like very, very old to be discovering this, she discovers that she is not a beta, but an omega. And so basically she gets thrust into this like whirlwind of events in which she is now like in heat for the first time. And so she needs to find a pack. And so she finds this pack of alphas and like falls in love with like six of them or whatever. And so she ends up in this like pack who are also like part of a motorcycle club. And so there's like some turf wars happening. Um, and so that's kind of like the plot element of this. Um, and they're also trying to convince her to like stay with them, whatever. It's very hard for me to explain the plot of this book because like 80% of this book is just smutty goodness. That's really what it is. Lola, I would say is actually like quite a bit less smutty than Baby. And Lola is Baby's best friend. Um, Lola is a beta. So she's kind of basically like, a regular human, essentially. Without spoiling anything, in book one, Lola goes through some really traumatic events. Um, and there's definitely some trigger warnings, I'd say, for both books. But in particular, Lola's book, um, Sexual Assault and Rape is definitely like a big trigger warning for that, I would say. But basically, in book one, she goes through something which we don't really know in book one, we just get hinted at it. Um, but in book two, it takes place after the events of book one. And so Lola is really uh, trying to come to terms with what happened to her. And she's really going through her trauma and, and the stress of that. She has become very afraid of alphas um, because of what happened to her. However, she finds herself feeling very unsafe, again, because of what happened to her um, and some kind of like loose ends that didn't tie up um, after the events of book one. And so she ends up seeking help from this like pack of alphas that she uh, has come to get to know. Again, I'm not really explaining these books very well, but I really think if you are into like reverse harem tropes, if you are into found family, these are just kind of like two of the most unexpected horny found families. And they truly like the character development that they all go through. I really, really enjoyed it. I think Baby is like a lot more fun. Um, if you just want like a fun, quick read, I think Baby is definitely the one. Um, if you want something that dives a little bit deeper, uh, Lola actually, I feel like Lola's 
storyline, her kind of grappling with her trauma and her kind of overcoming her insecurities and, and um, dealing with the trauma that she faced. I think that storyline is done really, really well. I love the way that Catherine Moon explored that and also how um, she kind of comes into her own. Like, it's like, yes, yeah, she's surrounded by these like six men or whatever, and she is surrounded by all these men that take care of her. But like, she's also not helpless and she can take care of herself. And I really love that aspect of the story as well. I definitely do think though that Lola being split into part one and part two was like a little unnecessary. Like, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say because book two was like the plot was dragged on for so long, but also one of the relationships is so underdeveloped. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I'm a little on the fence about that, but I really, really enjoyed across these three books, the characters, the relationships, the found family vibes, the kind of like dealing with trauma. Um, I really feel like all of that was handled very well. And then obviously on top of that, it's just like super sexy, super fun. And so I really enjoyed these books. Um, highly recommend them, especially if you have like Kindle Unlimited and you can read them for free like I did. The next book I want to talk about was actually a DNF. This was one of my most anticipated releases of the year. And so unfortunately I DNF'd it at about 10% in. So I can't really talk much about the plot or the characters, but I can tell you why I DNF'd it and why I didn't like it. And this book is Song of Silver, Flame Like Night. Again, I can't tell you a single thing about the plot or the characters, but the reason why I DNF'd it is because this very much falls into the category of books written by non-white authors but written for a white audience. That is really what this book feels like. And I'm just quite frankly at a point where I'm I'm over it. I'm over. I'm over these books. Um, let me talk about why I feel this way about this book though. This book specifically is marketed as Shansha and is comped frequently by the author like on social media to like Shansha C dramas in particular. And so based on these expectations, based on the marketing, um, I went into this book expecting Shansha. Like this book has a Chinese and an English title, okay? Like granted, I don't know what order the titles came in, like which one came first, but this book has a Chinese and an English title. And so I, based on the marketing, really went in expecting a very solid Shansha type of novel. Um, that's where I went wrong. This really is like a very westernized take on Shansha, which is not like a bad thing per se, but like it's just again not written for someone who looks like me. Um, here are some of my issues with it. The first thing that really stood out to me is honestly the fact that the kind of main antagonists are white colonizers. I know that sounds ridiculous to say, um, that I think it's weird that white colonizers are the villains of this book because they're the villains of life, truly. But I just found it very jarring, to be quite honest with you. I'm not saying that white people can't be in Shansha. However, I am saying that typically speaking in a Shansha novel or in a Shansha piece of work, you would not expect to find white people. If you disagree, please do leave a comment below. I'm not an expert. However, in my personal experience experiencing Shansha in different formats, I don't go into a Shansha novel expecting white people. I just don't. And there's just something about it that doesn't sit quite right with me in terms of like, I just feel like why in like a publishing landscape that is so overwhelmingly white, are we inviting whiteness into a genre that has never traditionally really had much whiteness, um, nor has it ever needed it. And so I just don't like feeling like I'm going into a genre expecting people who look like me, but instead I'm seeing white people again. And I know that like some people are gonna have problems with what I'm saying, but like, if you like this book, this is not a mark against you. This is just my personal feelings on the book. Some of the other things that bother me kind of just boil down also to the way Chinese was used in the text. Again, contributing to this like white gaze feel of this book is that, first of all, I don't actually know what the author was going for here. Like the, the, the romanization, the use of like tonal indicators was so inconsistent. Sometimes the words would feel like Mandarin pinyin, and then sometimes the words would feel like Cantonese or some other sort of dialect, but there was no rhyme or reason to it. It wasn't like certain characters spoke in certain dialects and others were speaking in like Mandarin. It was just so wildly inconsistent and I just couldn't figure out why. Like I honestly, that that would just baffled me to be quite honest with you. I just don't understand it. Um, and then the other thing that annoyed me was that it was just like random Chinese words would just be thrown into a sentence. Words that have 
actual English translation, so like there was just no need for it, and also it was just like defined in text in the most patronizing way. And the one I remember specifically that I got really irritated at was the, the sentence was just like, oh, so-and-so picked up a sword, but instead of the word sword, they used the Chinese word for it. And then they went on to define the word sword, and I was like, just say it's a fucking sword. And just like the way that the kind of like random sprinkling of like Chinese words was used felt very like, let me make this text a little more exotic, a little more <laughs> oriental. You know what I mean? Like it's just, that's the vibe it gave me. And again, I just feel like it's very specifically catering to like the white gaze. Um, and I just, I don't like it. I don't like it. The last thing I want to bring up, which is like a combination of kind of the two points I've brought up so far, is the naming thing. Um, so in the book, in this world, one of the things that they talk about is how like in the past, before the white colonizers, they had double character given names, okay? And then apparently the white colonizers came in and now it's imposed upon everyone. Everyone has to have single character given names. So they would have like a surname and then their given name, which is a single character, so combined two characters. Um, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. Um, I understand that this is fiction, and I understand that this is not historical, it's not supposed to be based in real fact, blah blah blah, I get it. F that's fine. That's a valid argument against what I'm saying. I just don't like, again, attributing certain things to whiteness when they are not things that are traditionally associated with whiteness at all. So if you're not familiar with like Chinese naming structures, basically we have our surname, which is like one character, typically speaking, sometimes two there, it just depends. And then your given name is either one or two characters, again, typically speaking. The kind of usage of one character versus two character given names is like, honestly, just like a preference thing. Some cultures, some regions will like have a preference for one over the other. So for example, in Hong Kong, uh, single character given names are much less common than other parts of China, for example. Um, but they are not uncommon by any means. Like a lot of people have single character given names. I do believe there was a period of time that double character given names went out of fashion. Whether that was mandated by the people in power or not, it, it definitely did go out of fashion. So for a really long time, um, single character names were like the preferred. Anyway, my point is single and double character given names has existed throughout Chinese history, okay? And at different times, one or the other will have more popularity. To my knowledge, there has never been a time where single character given names being the trend uh, was a Western influence. Again, I could be wrong. But for me, like this book, attributing like something that is very common in Chinese culture to Western culture does not sit right with me. Again, I know the book presents it as this like negative thing, but again, I like it's not a negative thing. Like some people just have single character names. It's not something A to be viewed as like lesser than double character names, and it's not something that I think needs to be associated with whiteness and with Western culture in any way, shape, or form. And I know as I say this, like it sounds like I am gatekeeping culture and I, that I'm gatekeeping something from like readers. I get it. I get that it sounds like that. But again, I just think that once again, this book was not written with Chinese readers in mind. This book was written for specifically white readers. And I just, for me, again, this is not a book for me. And so I chose not to read it. Anyway, I don't think I've been like talking about this very coherently. I just like feel very annoyed about it. Um, I'm very disappointed by it. Um, Anyway, that's it on that topic. And then let's move into my final book that I want to talk about, and that is Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. I really enjoyed this. Uh, this doesn't come out until May. I obviously got an e-arc of it. Thank you, HarperCollins Canada. Um, but I liked this, I think. I didn't actually give it a rating. I find it very awkward to give a book like this a rating. And let me explain why. Because if you don't know what it's about, we are following our narrator, our main character, Juniper, um, who is a white woman. Um, she is a writer. She has not had much luck with her debut novel. Like it, she just really did not have a great release um, and had like a really bad series of events with her publisher and editor, etc. Um, she has a friend. I use the term friend very loosely. Um, a frenemy sort of from college called Athena. And Athena is a Chinese American woman. She is kind of like a literary darling. Okay. She is very successful, uh, very critically acclaimed. And one night as they are hanging out, Athena chokes on a piece of pancake and she dies. Juniper in the kind of spur of the moment, um, grabs Athena's 
most recent manuscript and decides to take it home with her. Just, just for later. For just for later. And what she ends up doing is she ends up rewriting parts of the story um, and kind of reworking it, giving it edits, and submitting it as her own manuscript. And it is a historical fiction novel about the Chinese laborers during World War One, I, I believe. I don't fully remember what the inside story was, but basically Juniper rebrands herself from Juniper Hayward, her name, to Juniper Song, which I believe is her middle name or something, but obviously sounds a little bit more racially ambiguous. Um, she publishes this book. She takes, you know, new headshots of herself that are a little bit more ambiguous. She publishes this book and she becomes like an instant overnight success. This book is simultaneously incredibly fun and just like addictive to read and yet has very thought-provoking elements to it. There's a lot of conversations about the situation at hand, which is obviously that this white woman has plagiarized and stolen a manuscript from a dead Chinese <laughs> author. Um, however, there's just generally more conversations about publishing and the flaws in publishing and the way that publishing tokenizes uh, marginalized authors and conversations as well about how um, white authors, white people often take up space where they really shouldn't be. And what I like most about this book, I think, is that neither sides are pictured as like good or bad. There are like good and bad things about both sides. It's just fundamentally a book about these people who are like doing the most wild mental gymnastics to like justify to themselves what they're doing is okay. That what they're doing is not morally incorrect. And I think this book is so fascinating to me in, per in terms of like the the concepts that it explores and this fundamental concept of like how far are people willing to go in order to mentally justify what they know or reasonably know is not morally correct according to their own values even. Um, I thought about this book a lot with the whole um, Hogwarts Legacy game coming out and people kind of like jumping over all the hoops and like bending over backwards to try and justify why they're playing this game but still supporting trans rights. And as that whole situation was unfolding, continues to unfold, I was like, these mental gymnastics, this is what Juniper Hayward was doing in Yellowface. And so, like, I think that the conversations in this book can be applied a lot more generally than what the book does within its pages. Um, and I really like that about the book. What I don't love about the book um, and why I feel like I can't give it a rating is that it is so very obviously um, and intentionally so a bit of a self-insert for Rebecca. There are some moments specifically um, that feel like they are copy and pasted straight from a Rebecca Kwong um, interview. And do I think the average reader would pick up on that? Do I think the average reader would care? Probably not. But like as a, a big, big RF Kwong stan, I have read and watched all these interviews. And so as I'm reading it, I'm like, I know she has said that in an interview before. I know that like she has said that in the past regarding herself. And so like, it does feel a little too self-inserty at times. That being said, I actually didn't feel like overall it was too self-inserty for my liking. But again, I just don't feel comfortable giving a rating knowing how much of the author's own life experiences and words went into this book um, in the same way that I don't feel comfortable writing a memoir. Um, obviously this is not a memoir. Obviously this is very fictional, but like I said, it's just like, it just toes that line a little too much for me to be, feel comfortable writing it. But anyway, those are all the other books that I've read recently that I haven't talked about yet on my channel. And hopefully some of this is salvageable by editing me because I am not used to speaking in front of a camera anymore. But yeah, that is it for today. If you watched until the end, as always, I super, super appreciate it. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and comment down below. Let me know if you've read any of these books, what books you've been reading recently. And if you want to see more from me, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. That is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time.